Would someone just lift your voice to the Lord for a moment? Woe is me. That's how some of you feel tonight. I'm unclean, but I tell you, there's something powerful about the fact that God imputes his righteousness, that God imparts what he is into our life. We don't have to live the way that we were. We don't have to live in the bondage and the shame of the past, but God is willing to allow his presence, his holiness, his ability, his spirit, the gifts of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit into our life. Aren't you thankful for that? We don't have to be who we were, but God allows us to be this brand new person in him. God allows us to be a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. God allows us to step out of our past, who we were, what we were, and step into a brand new hope, a brand new future, a brand new purpose that God has for us. No wonder Isaiah said, woe is me. We do too when we see the glory of God, when we see the holiness of God. We fall far below that, but God says, hang on. I want to do this work of impartation. I want to do this work of transformation. I want to fill you with my spirit. That's what God desires to do. He never leaves us the way that he found us. He brings us up to a higher place. He sets us on a higher level. He calls us into heavenly places with Christ Jesus. He he doesn't leave us in the low depths, in the miry clay, but he puts our foot on a rock. He establishes our going. He puts us on a path of righteousness. Surely, could Goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. We don't have to stay the way that we were. God allows us to become something brand new. A hope is there for us. Thank God for that. Would you just thank Him for a moment? Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. We're talking about momentum, about moving forward. Put whatever tag you want on it. Spiritual inertia. We're talking about just allowing God to bring us to a place. But then when we get to that place, realize that God isn't finished with us. I like completing tasks. How many just like completing tasks? I'll tell you, Eric Porter is one of the most undersung heroes that we have. But one of Eric's key to success is this. He always has a to-do list. And he'll start at the top of that to-do list or you'll see him running around with a pad of paper and there's about 20 different tasks on it. But in the middle of those tasks, there's this big line through. And then when he gets all the lines through or when he gets most of them through and he's carrying around this tattered piece of paper, he starts all over again. Now he likes completing tasks. He likes completing it. And I like completing tasks too. I like getting things done. I like being able to look back and and say, you know what, we finished that job there. But so many things in ministry aren't tangibles. We can't say we're finished there. And we can't say that about the places that God brings us to. God's not finished with you yet. You may be the most, you may have hung your own plaque on your own wall about completion about being complete. God's finished with, no, he's not finished with you yet. Just ask a neighbor, ask your spouse, ask your children, ask your parents, ask anybody else. God's not finished with you yet. Ask God. God, are you finished with us yet? No. God's not done with us yet. Why? Because as long as God has left us here, God has a plan for us. He's got a purpose for us. So we're talking about that. And just, uh, just talking about how that there's experiences that we have in our life. Our text is from David in 1 Samuel chapter 17. But the fact that David took experiences in his life, he could have forever just kind of talked to his brothers, talked to his family, talked to his little village community about the fact that God had allowed him to slay a bear and defeat a lion. But he takes those experiences and he brings them along with him in his life experience, in the walk that God brings him on. And he's on what he probably initially determines to be uh, just an errand of serving his brothers for his father. And he's bringing them a meal and he comes in contact with the fearful Israelite army and a giant from on the other side of the fence. The Philistines have their great warrior Goliath and they have declared that whoever defeats Goliath will have served, will allow them to become their servants. But if Goliath defeats them, they're to become servants to the Philistines. 
And something rises up in the heart of David. And it's in those moments where we realize God isn't finished with me yet. And so sometimes when we look at the Goliaths on the horizon or the circumstances in our life that seem too big for us, God expects us and allows us to turn around and look at some things that have happened in our past, in our recent history, so that we can say, God has a plan for my future, and I'm going to bring that experience into this circumstance, and I'm going to defeat the enemy, I'm going to defeat the giant in my life, because God's not finished with me yet. God's not finished with me yet. And so I'd just like to take a moment, and we'll pick this story up. Saul is speaking to David, King Saul. He's, he's, uh, he's been brought this young servant boy who has great desire to defeat the, the enemy. And David begins to tell him about why he is capable and able to defeat the giant. And David brings the experience of his past. He said to Saul, thy servant, verse 34 of 1 Samuel 17, thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Seeing as he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with you. Go and the Lord be with you. There was something undeniable about David's intention, his attention to what God was, ha what was happening around him. And, uh, and uh, I just believe that his, his perspective of being able to look backwards and, and say, you know, that victory wasn't just the end all be all. That victory was to propel me forward. That victory was to allow me to move into the destiny that God had for me has for me. And I, I just wish you'd let that spirit come into your spirit tonight, that idea about God taking you further, about God allowing you to become a victor, triumphant in Christ. We preached about it all weekend, pastor on Sunday morning, brother Shalom on Sunday night, how that we are, we are over the enemy. He is under our feet, period. We have the right to defeat him. We have the right to trample him. We have the right to step on top of him and go into the plan that God has for us. And so let's just kind of let that attitude over the last few services rest in our spirit. Let's pray together before we're seated. Father, I thank you tonight for talking to us, for helping us. God, I thank you for encouraging us and God delivering us. Some things that you've already done are great things and I'm asking tonight that you would Allow us to step into a place of victory, not only now, but in our future as well. In Jesus' name, we pray. And the church said, amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Everyone say, continue. Now is not the time to sit back and take it easy because of some of the things that God has been doing for us. Now is the time for us to step it up. Now is the time for us to invite. Now is the time for us to reach. Now is the time for us to teach, talk, fellowship, love, care, help. Do whatever God allows you to do, whatever door God opens for you. Now is the time for us to step into the plan that God has for us because it's a great one. God is, he, he, he hasn't limited our abilities. God hasn't limited our vision. We haven't kind of went back to the drawing board. You know, we've, we've been here about 15 years now. We celebrated that just, just a few weeks ago. And uh, can I tell you that the vision that, that God gave pastor and that God released to our team and our church 15 years ago hasn't diminished one bit. If anything, it's become clearer. If anything, it's become, it's just become more on the horizon. It's kind of risen out of the dust. It's risen to this place. And, and we can see how God has taken uh, some experiences and he's put some sinew on some old dry bones. God is putting some flesh on it. God's, God's allowing us to see the church come together and, and people getting in the right places of ministry and people becoming involved, people becoming excited about what God is doing. And, and we've watched this formation happen before us, but it isn't just so that the church can become a healthy body. It's so that the church can become a fighting force. It's so that the church can become its entire purpose, an outreach machine, an opportunity to reach our city. 
an opportunity to reach your community, an opportunity to touch your family or your workplace. That is what God is doing. He's allowing us, he's giving us a broad vision, but he's also bringing it close to home. God's allowing us to see that lost loved ones can come back. Hopeless situations can be turned around. I only have to peel the carpet back on this platform for us to see some prayer requests that are underneath our feet right here. Because before we put the carpet down, we talk to God about some things that we would love to see him do. And God has done many of those things already. There's already victory reports about what's underneath our feet right here on this platform. Why? Because God is in this work of continuing. We haven't quit because God answered 90% of what's happened here. Uh Uh-uh, I'll tell you what happens. We just kind of take that victory and we add it to the the thing that's pushing the church forward. We we take that victory, we take that victory report, and we add it to this, uh, this momentum that God has given to us because God is moving us closer to the vision that he has for our church. I wish someone would just thank God for that for a moment. I'll wait on you. God has done some great things. Each victory gained gives us greater faith for the next battle. That's momentum. I'll give you the five points that we talked about last week, and we can celebrate them together. Each victory gives us greater faith for the next battle. David had faith because of the lion and the bear. Going in, I'm sure he was afraid, but when he stepped out of that situation, fear turned to faith. And so whatever it is that you're facing in your life, God allows your fear to be transformed into faith. We'll work together. Number two, you should always go into battle with momentum from your previous victories. I think one of the challenges for us is that we have valley experiences, but we take too long when we get to the valley. We kind of stay there. You ever ride a bike between two hills? Don't stop at the bottom. (laughs) Pedal on. You you know, if if you're driving down between two hills, you don't put the brakes on and stop at the bottom and say, I hate this valley experience. I hate the fact that there's a hill ahead. I'll tell you what you do. Momentum is that when you come into that valley experience and you know that there's a hill ahead of you, you don't stop where you're at. You just kind of make your mind up. I am not stopping here. I'm going forward. Why? Because I, I know what the, I know what it's like on top of the mountain and I don't need to stay here in this valley. I'm going back up the mountain and the, the longer I take here in the valley, the harder it's going to be for me to continue my trek. So don't stop in the middle of your failure. Don't stop in the middle of your defeat. Don't stop there. I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to f- get God to forgive you. You need to forgive yourself and you need to move forward. You need to just kind of keep the bike rolling long enough to get up through that experience. And by the time you make your, your way up to the other side, if you haven't stopped, you allow the momentum of previous victory to bring you into another place of victory. That's the power of momentum. I, I, I talked to you about, you know, we, we discussed the physics of momentum and uh, mass times velocity. We talked about how that, you know, that that is just a, a, a fact in the natural. It's, it's, a, it's a law in the natural, that momentum is gained because you allow mass and velocity to become connected. You you allow it to move forward together. And there's something in our spirit life in the same way that if we allow that mass, that, that critical mass of who you are in Christ to connect with the path that God has you on, the purpose that God has set before you, if you allow those two things to come together, then you can go forward into God's purpose for your life. That's momentum. That's spiritual momentum. So you should always go into battle with momentum from your previous victories. Don't hold up in the valley. Number three, proper understanding of momentum acknowledges its importance. When you know that you can move forward, when you know that God is with you, he's moving with you, then don't stop. Carry on. Continue. David said, I I pursued my enemies. He said, I overtook them. He said, I have wounded them that were not able to rise, but he didn't stop there. 
He said that he continued on. He chased them. He said, I beat them as small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as dust in the streets. He said, I didn't stop just when the enemy was down. I didn't quit just when I caught up to them. He said, but I made sure that I completed the work that God called me to do. Don't stop when God is moving forward with you. Once the Lord, number four, when the Lord gives you momentum, use it for your advantage. Don't stop after a slight victory. Continue until the enemy is completely routed and until you have totally won. And five, the, the period following each victory is not the time to put your feet up. There are Goliaths to face after you defeat your lion and bear. Don't quit there. One of the most, uh, one of my favorite parts about the New Testament is the fact that, that, that you can understand that after God filled those disciples, those 120 that were waiting in the upper room, after he filled them with his spirit, they didn't stop there. As a matter of fact, we, we love Acts 2, 38. We, we preach about it. But if you will just continue on, you'll find that they continued on. Acts 2 and verse 40. And with many, many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So everyone say, great revival. I'm looking forward to that revival here at CCC. But it says in verse 42, it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It wasn't just a church of 3,000 because verse 42 tells us they continued. They didn't stop. The momentum of the victory of receiving God's spirit, the momentum of the victory of 3,000 people being converted, 3,000 people being saved, that didn't just kind of give them the license to sit back. Look, we've been waiting 40 days in the upper room. We've been waiting for the spirit. We've been waiting a long time for this to happen. We're going to take a break now. That's not what the New Testament church said. They said, you know what? This is a time for us to move forward. Take the momentum that God has given us and let's move into the revival that God has in store for us. And there's just something touching down in my spirit tonight. I'm, I'm just wanting it to transfer to you. And so I wish you'd just take one moment, lift your hand, and we just say, God, would you continue? Continue through me. Continue through our church. Continue what we've got, what you've begun. Let us continue steadfastly in the the apostles doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers God let us continue what you've begun we don't want to stop we want to keep the ball moving God we want to keep going forward come on let's just thank God for what he's done already I'm thanking I'm thanking God for hearing some prayer that we've been praying lately I tell you we, we drove to St. John last night talked to my dad, didn't stay a long time, didn't want to wear him out, but he's home now. He's out of the hospital and a surgery that was very serious when the doctor said, you better take time to talk to your family about this surgery. Can I tell you that as we're standing on this side of it, I can take the victory of that experience and step into some very difficult situations and know that God's got my back, that God is working for me, that God is on my side. We can, we can just kind of move forward with faith because we've been through some things. God's taken us places and we can trust him with the circumstance and we can trust him with the situation because God has given us momentum right now. Move forward with it. The enemy understands that momentum is very powerful. As a matter of fact, he will do everything he can to stop it. Nehemiah, just read the story of Nehemiah. The enemy shows up time after time. Why? Because the people showed up and we know that when you have a mind to work, when you have a mind to do the work that God has called you to do, when that's in your mind, there isn't anything that the devil can do to stop you. When you get this church thing working on you on Monday and on Tuesday, when it becomes a part of your fellowship and your conversation, when it becomes something you think about and you dream about, it's something that you talk about and it's part of the dialogue and discussion that you have with people, can I tell you that the enemy fears that? Because when you've got a mind to work, when you've got a mind after the heart of God, when you let God's mind come into your mind, the devil stands back and says, we better pull a team together to distract and defeat them because there isn't anything that can stop them. We know from the story of Babel that when people get united and get their minds made up, that there isn't anything that can stop them. And it's the same way with Nehemiah. Sam Ballot showed up. He was bent on stopping Nehemiah. He was bent on stopping the work. He was bent on discouraging them and defeating them. But Nehemiah said, we're not coming off the wall. We're not stopping because we've already got this thing moving. We're going into the place that God has for us.
for us. There's revival on the future. We aren't quitting now. Church, can I tell you, we're not quitting now. We've got a few victories behind us, but we've got many more victories before us. It's right in front of us. If we're willing to take the victory from the past, move it into the present, God will bring us into the victory in the future. Continue on. I tell you, Stephen is martyred in the New Testament, in Acts, but the church carried on. Peter is in jail, but the church carries on. Paul and Silas are in chains, but the church carries on. Revival or riot, they made their mind up. We are going to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I have to carry on. You're too worried. I know, I know, I know, I know where you are. If we worship now, this is going to be till 830. <laughs> Paul and Silas, they're going to be something happened. There's going to be an earthquake happen in this, in this old jail cell. Something's going to happen. Get to praising, get to singing, get to worshiping God. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. Can I tell you that they carried on? They didn't stop. Acts 2 was the beginning, but if they had just quit there, they, we, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the Acts of the Apostles. We'd have the experience of the Apostles. There would have been an amen at the end of chapter 2, but the scripture tells us that they continued steadfastly. There's something about a steadfast continuing that God honors intensely. He just, he just shows up. When God gives you that momentum, use it to your advantage. Make it work for you. David said, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Continuing on. So <clears throat> what happens? How do we, uh, some people say, well, you know, I, I know what it feels like when I'm encouraged and I know what it feels like when I'm rolling down the hill. Before I get to that valley experience, when I'm, when I'm moving in momentum and I'm moving forward, I know what that feels like. But what about when I don't feel that way? What about when life becomes challenging? What about when my situation becomes discouraging? What about when fear takes hold and disrupts my circumstance? That's what happens when Goliath shows up. That's what happened with all of Israel. They're cowering behind. They're hiding like scared animals. They don't know what to do. They don't, I tell you, I tell you because they didn't have the experience of the past, and someone needed to step to the forefront, and that someone might be you. Let me tell you what happened. It's intimidating to be the only one worshiping. It's intimidating because we, have, we all have a little bit of ego. I'm coming down to where you live. We all have a little bit of ego. I know what it's like. I do it right here, sometimes on Sunday. And it's like, okay... Come on, Alan Porter, hit the aisle. <laughs> Come on, Curtis Scott, fire it up. Come on, Kathy, play the right song. Come on, come on. And it's like, you're kind of, no one wants to be the first one. But something happens when we just kind of say, you know, God's been too good. Something happens when just somebody... When just someone kind of breaks out of the tradition, when someone steps past that barrier, when someone just kind of breaks out a little bit, there's something that happens. And you don't know, but you may be the one David who says, you know what, I'm willing to bring the experience of yesterday into the middle of today. No one else. I, I, maybe if I go by the status quo, if I go by what everyone else is doing right now, I should be sitting in my pew with my hands folded. But if I bring the experience from yesterday... If I bring the experience about what God has done, that's why there's something powerful about your testimony. The blood is powerful, but let me tell you, when you get the power of your testimony connected to the power of the blood, you, you, can't, you can't sit still. You can't just kind of step back because God's been too good. When you remember your testimony, it's personal. It's not about what happened to somebody else, but it's about what happened to you. It's about what God has done in your life. It's about what God has done in your family. It's about how God moved in your history, your heritage, what God 
God did to turn your circumstance around. There is something that happens when you connect the power of the blood that we preached about on Sunday. When you connect the power of the blood to your testimony because there's something powerful about your testimony to you that you can't stand still. You can't just sit there when you begin to think about what God has done. And when you begin to declare it, you step out like David and said, I, I can't stand still any longer. I know everybody else may not be able to pull yesterday's experience into today, but I can and I will because it's going to turn something around. Israel, you don't have to be defeated. Israel, you don't have to stay in the background. Israel, you don't have to cower in fear. It's time to step into a place a victory and when you do all of a sudden something happens people begin to talk a little bit oh you don't understand you don't understand what God's done in their life and something stirs up in their spirit and they remember their testimony they remember what God has done for them they remember how God has moved in their life in their family and something begins to happen in the whole corporate body and before long Israel's pushing David before King Saul because they believe the report that David has Goliath is going to go down we are going to be triumphant that's the power of your testimony you see it just kind of changes the environment when we have just a few people realize what God has done in their life Teresa I remember Sunday, what God did for you just a few years ago. Turn her life around, turn her family around, and I can rejoice with that. So Goliath may be standing on the horizon, but if you are willing to move forward in that momentum that God has given you, it will bring victory, not just for you. You don't know what your testimony can do in an entire church. You don't know how it might be the one thing that sets revival rolling forward. It was a servant boy that showed up with a lunch. It was a servant boy that showed up. David, just little David, just little bro David. Give us the food and get on your way. But David, he, he gets engaged in what's happening. And he knows. He's just experienced some powerful victory. He knows that we don't have to be intimidated. And he knows we don't have to be in fear. And he just needs to be one little voice to speak up and say, why is he able to do that? Why is Goliath able to say that and get away with it? How does he have the right to defy the army? Not just of a God, but of a living God. A God that's at work. A God that's in control. A God that's moving and ministering. A God that's turning our world toward revival right now. While people are falling off the end towards sin and slavery and debt. And just everything that's happening. Heart problems and trouble in their lives. Trouble in their homes. God is saying, I've got a church ready, prepared. Ready for revival. I've got revival waiting. There are people that want turn to turn toward righteousness. There's a highway of holiness waiting, and you may be the one to get that ball of revival moving in this church with your testimony. Be willing to declare it. Be willing to speak it. Be willing to follow through with it. In Acts, in the midst of all of the challenges that were coming the way of that new birthed New Testament church, with all the threatenings that was happening, with the with the threat of martyrdom, with the threat of jail, with the threat of just persecution. Their prayer was this. In verse 30, 29, of, 29 and 30 of Acts chapter 4, it said, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness, I would say boldness, they may speak thy word. They weren't asking just for a covering. They weren't asking for a wall to separate them from the challenges. They said, God... In the middle of all this persecution, here's what we're praying for. We're praying that you will give us boldness. Don't let us sit back. Don't let us be silent. Don't let us just sit by the wayside. But let us step into this place and declare your victory. Give us boldness, God. Boldness is such a necessity when you move toward this place 
of victory. It's momentum, boldness. Not fear, but boldness. Don't let fear rule your mind. Don't let fear overcome you. Just let God just, you know, worrying is negative praying. Worrying is praying to yourself. You turn that around and begin to pray to God. Turn that around and begin to talk to the one that can control it, the one that can manage it, the one that can turn it around. Don't worry about it. Pray about it. Worrying can't do anything for you, but praying, that's a different story. God, you know the concern that's on my, God, you know the fear that's in my life right now. And that boldness turns that circumstance. Give us, God, give us boldness. Proverbs says, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 28, verse 1, the righteous are bold as a lion. The, the preview to that verse is, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. Ephesians 3, 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Scripture tells us to approach his throne with boldness. To come before his presence, that we, are, we have the right to come boldly. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 13, for they that have used the office of deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Boldness is all through the New Testament. It's there, Hebrews 4, I just mentioned it a moment ago. We can come boldly to his throne and receive his mercy. It's there, boldness. The opportunity is there for us to receive boldness. So why sit in fear? Tap your neighbor and say, be bold. If you use momentum, then you will prevail. 2 Samuel chapter 3 and 1 speaks of a, long, of a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But the Bible tells us that David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. David capitalized on the momentum that God gave him. And we know God's plan, that God was moving Saul aside and bringing David in. But David, that victory was waiting for him if he was willing to move forward. That momentum made him stronger and stronger, while those aligned against him became weaker and weaker. David grew great in the Lord. In all of his time, his momentum carried him all the way to the throne of Israel and to victory over all his and his people's enemies. Each victory gave him increased momentum for his next challenge. Momentum is meant to carry us from victory to victory. That valley in the middle, I know we all have to walk through the valley. God allows us. He leads us there. But sometimes God leads us there because he's wanting us to experience what it's like to come up into victory. 2 Corinthians tells us that now where the Spirit, now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 18, but we all, with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed from the same image into the same image, from glory. I would say from glory to glory. There's a transition that happens in our life. Now we love to live in glory. We're living in glory on Sunday night. End of service. Young people all worshiping, music still going. Finally, Ryan, because his arms are nearly falling off, <laughs> shuts it down, and the kids continue. Because we love living in glory. But Scripture tells us that we are changing the same image into the same image, that this process of transitioning into the people that God desires for us to be only happens if we go from glory to glory. And there is a transition that happens when we leave a place of glory and experience. You can't, glory is, if it's just glory to glory, that would be great. But often, the transition from glory to glory is a very difficult path. Like a butterfly, pick any tadpole to frog, pick any illustration you want. You can fill in the blank and I'll move quickly. We want to transition in glory, and God says, no, you have to go from glory to glory. God, can't I just stay in glory? No. 
No, you have to leave glory before you go to the next place of glory that I have in store for you. And we know that's true because in Matthew 17, quick illustration, Peter, James, and John, his brother, or yeah, were, <clears throat> they went up into a high mountain with Jesus. And verse 2 says, he was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. And this is Peter's idea because why would you ever want to leave glory? Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. This is a great place to be. Glory. Someone say glory. glory. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And I think in the back of Peter's mind, he's thinking, why would we ever leave this place? Why would we ever want to leave glory? This is the epitome of why we've done what we've done. This is why we've walked the roads we've walked, talked to the people we've talked to. This is why he's discipled us so that we could come to this place of glory. And we know that that wasn't the right question and it wasn't the right decision because God knew that there was a greater glory awaiting. But to get to that greater glory, the greater glory of an empty tomb, they had to leave the Mount of Transfiguration and go through some pretty rough territory. Greater glory awaits, Peter. But you're going to experience a greater glory than this. Wait until you chase John into the tomb and look at death defeated. Wait in Jerusalem until what you feel here on the Mount of Transfiguration moves inside of you. Peter, you're going to stumble out of an upper room. You're going to preach salvation message. You're going to unlock the door to salvation. And you'll understand why we left this place of glory to go to glory. And it's the same in our life, church, but we need to bring the experience of the past. Is it going to mean no failure? Absolutely not, because Peter failed. Peter denied him three times. Peter failed. We know Peter failed, but Peter wasn't defeated and God wasn't done with him. He went from glory to glory. God's purpose, God's plan is greater. Don't quit now. Number eight, if you don't use momentum to work for you, it will work against you. David's victories came to an end because of his experience with Bathsheba, 2 Samuel chapter 11. Scripture tells us that David was sitting back while his men were in battle. He was hobnobbing in the high tower while his men were in the heat of the fight. He was too big for battle. He had become too important. He had become too comfortable. He had become too disconnected from the daily struggle. And he rested on yesterday's triumphs when he should have been discovering brand new victory. He refused to resist the current temptation and the result was tragic. He sinned with Bathsheba. But it didn't stop there. He put Uriah on the front line and forced him in a death march and tried to cover his own wrongdoing. Those sins opened the door for Absalom to work against him and the outcome caused Absalom's conspiracy to gain momentum against David. And the very thing that worked for him, everybody knew who he was, everyone knew his greatness now, worked against him. David's story alone is why we should never stop and relax after God gives us victory. What had worked so well, what had pushed so far, now is something that was becoming a hindrance. People knew who David was. You know, you can become successful, but not too successful. And David had become so successful that people began to look for a good excuse for him to fail. And when he did, they jumped on it. Not only those around him, but those of his own family became those against him. So don't stop. If there is a pause in the story, and I hate to take it from the high, celebration down to this low, but that's the caution that we have to realize. Don't stop when God moves us forward. Everyone say, I'm continuing on. 
continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Joseph, way you can come and help me with the music. Once anything gains momentum, whether good or evil, it's hard to stop. So make sure that you move in the right direction. Make sure that you're going the right way. The caution comes along with commendation. The caution comes along with celebration. We can know that if we continue moving in the right direction, that God is going to work for us. He's going to be there with us. We know that if we go in the wrong direction, you can read what happened. The conspiracy was strong. The people increased, continued with Absalom. And finally, there came a messenger to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said to all of his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. Only David's prayers and God's intervention stopped Absalom's momentum in that season of David's life. Didn't have to end that, or it didn't end that way, but it didn't have to go that way. And church, we, we know that we can go from glory to glory. But we just need to make that intermittent season happen speedily. As quick as God will let us get through the valley, we need to go into that next place of victory with purposed hearts, purposed minds, knowing, you know what, we've got, because David at this point of his life, I love it because he didn't stop, he continued on. What was the strength to continue on? I'll tell you, the part of the reason was because not only did he just have two victories in his past, not only did he just have three victories in his past, he didn't just have a lion and a bear and he was going to live for the remainder of his life on that experience, but rather because he kept moving forward. The victories in his past allowed him to know, I can trust God. I'd rather fall into the hands of God than the hands of man. Let him know that he'd rather trust God, fear him, love him, serve him, because if he just hung on long enough, God would bring him into another place of glory again. That's moving with God's momentum. So finally, last point tonight, victory is worth repeating. Isn't that the most obvious point I've made of 10? Yes, victory is worth repeating. Who wants to repeat defeat? No one, but we wanna repeat victory. So if you bring victory from yesterday into today, then God has a plan for us to be victorious again. I can't help but feel I'm preaching faith into somebody right now. For some, it's a lesson, but for someone tonight, it's hope. For some of us, it's a great, it's a great reminder. But for someone tonight, you're hanging on to every word right now. Because God's talking to you that you don't have to live in defeat. You can live in a place of victory. And I don't know who that person is, and I'm not trying to pick it because God knows. His word will speak when my word won't. But God's finding you right where you are, and there's something just in my spirit holding up saying, you better talk about that just for a minute because somebody needs to hear it again. I can tell you, you don't have to stay in defeat. God will bring you into a place of victory. Don't stop there. Carry on. The victory of the past isn't the last victory God has in store for you. There's a victory on the other side of whatever you're walking through right now. Don't quit. Keep moving forward. Don't stop. Keep pressing on. Don't quit because God is moving us into that place of victory. CCC, God's got great revival for us. We're going to continue pressing on. We're going to continue pressing forward. We're not stopping here. We're moving on into that place that God has for us. Defeat isn't for us. A God of victory won't have a people that live in defeat. So continue. Continue steadfastly. Continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Continue steadfastly when persecution rises up. Continue steadfastly when you're the only one standing. Continue steadfastly when it's your testimony that's going to turn the tide of what God is doing in our church, in our families, in our cities, what God is doing in our workplace. Continue steadfastly. Don't quit. And you don't have to stop there. You can see that all through Scripture, over and over and over again, the Scripture admonishes us. Continue. Carry on. Press on. 
a crown of righteousness for the for the one that just won't quit the one that will just press on into the purpose of God Colossians 1 and 12 says strengthen with all might according to his glorious power and unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness it's long suffering but we're not going to quit Revelation 2.10, fear none of those things which, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Victory is there if you don't quit. Revelation 2, verses 8, And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. That's victory right there. That's from victory to victory which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich and I know thy blas the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which shall, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation 10 days, but be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Don't quit there. Don't stop. Continue on. That's the background. If you look to Revelation chapter 3, that verse, can, that, that, that whole storyline, that whole admonition continues. He said, because thou hast kept the word of my, my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world and to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that, though, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. He's saying, to him that overcometh. In other words, if you've got something up against you, come over it, because that makes you an overcomer. If you've got a valley that you're in and a mountain before you, don't stop in the middle of the valley, because if you just climb to the top, if you just let that momentum bring you up into that next place, God has a plan for your life. It's called overcoming, and that makes you an overcomer. Don't quit when you're feeling defeated, when you're feeling discouraged, when you're in the middle of depression. Don't stop there, because God says if you'll just work through that with me let's go forward let's take yesterday's victory bring it in today move it into tomorrow because God has a plan for your life and it's called overcoming that's the power of momentum in your life would you stand together with me father I thank you for your word tonight God I'm grateful for how you've talked to us for the way that you've ministered in this room to many Lord your word is so powerful when we don't even understand ourselves and we can't make heads or tails, we can't make sense of what's happening. God, if we just allow your word to speak to us, you said, God, that it would divide right into the midst of our heart. God, that the thoughts and the intents that we have, it would dis God, that it would show us what they are. And God, give us the opportunity, I pray, in that moment to Align it with your purpose and your plan, which is a people that live in victory. God, whether the enemy thinks he's winning, whether the en enemy feels like he's winning, we know that you have the last say. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we stand firm in that promise tonight. God, we stand firm in the fact that you are leading and that you are guiding. And I pray, God, the momentum that you've given us. Would someone just pray that with me? pray that God would let it continue, let it move us into the next place of victory. God, I thank you for God 25 receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I thank you for people being baptized, but we don't want to stop there. God, we want to move into that victory report continually, God, that you have for us. Order our steps, God. Just make that prayer personal for a minute, would you? And at the same time of praying, would you just kind of commit, make a deep commitment to something that you personally need to change or something that you personally want to adjust, something that you personally want to commit to. And would you just take a moment and commit that to God and let this season that we've had together, let tonight just kind of do something beyond tonight in your life. God, I pray that you would, that your words settle into spirits. God, let it be a reminder. Let us have your mind. God, let it become part of our dialogue, our discussion. God, the things that we talk about. God, let eternal measures and eternal weights become part of the plan that you have for us. Would someone just say amen? Amen. 
I believe that God has a plan and a purpose for every one of us. And God has a plan and a purpose for all of us. So we're saying amen to his purpose and his plan. You're dismissed tonight. Thank you for being in Bible study with us. Thank you for receiving the word. Thank you for acting on it.